you. And it goes down to chi 1. Right? That's just the absolute value of a Gaussian. So it's a Jacobi matrix. OK, so, so this is Trotter's theorem. Um, and and what, you know, what, the way he claimed is that this matrix, if you write it like this with independent entries, has the same eigenvalue distribution as a GOE. And in fact, it has the same, same spectral measure as well, uh, uh, which, which, we, which we have seen. <coughs> now, OK. Um, how much time do I have? Really? How much? 24. 24 minutes. OK, good. Uh, so, so I want to do some Benjamin Isham convergence here, <laughs> but let me let me first uh, let me first look at uh, yeah the spectral measure of Z. We didn't do that actually. This belongs to the first part of the talk, so we'll do it now. So what's the spectral measure of Z? Uh, well, you know, you can compute it in many ways, but let me do it without computation. So let's look at the n-cycle. Okay. You know that the spectral measure of the n-cycle converges to the spectral measure of Z. Or the eigenvalue distribution of the, of the n-cycle also converges to the spectral measure of Z, because of Benjamin Isham convergence. So what, so what is the eigenvalue distribution of the n-cycle? That's not hard, right? What is it? Well, the n-cycle, the adjacency matrix, if I call this T, this matrix, which is just the right shift matrix, OK? This is the right shift matrix. Um, then the adjacency matrix is just T plus T transpose. Right? T transpose is T inverse, so T and T transpose commute. Mm -hmm. um, so in fact, I can get the eigenvalues of T plus T transpose just by understanding the eigenvalues of T. But you know the eigenvalues of, of right shift matrix, right? It's just the, the roots of unity. It's the basic, basics of finite, finite Fourier, Fourier analysis. So these are exactly the roots of unity. And the eigenvalues of, of T transpose uh, are going to be the conjugates of those. So the same eigenspace will have the conjugate eigenvalue, or the inverse of the eigenvalue. Um, so we're adding an eigenvalue. So these roots of unity, they live on the circle. OK, and then you take, take this, uh, and you add its, add its inverse. So you could think of this a, fo a following way. Let me think of it this way. So you take a, a circle of, of, of radius 2, OK? And you project, you just take the real parts. OK? So I, I, you know, I'm basically writing it like this. Okay. So take a circle of radius 2 uh, and, and take the real parts of the eigenvalues of, of that. That's going to be the eigenvalues of A. OK? This is, this is, this is, this is OK. OK, you can compute it directly, too. Um, so where does this converge? Well, the circle converges in Benjamin Isham to Z. And from this picture, you can figure out what is the, what is the limiting, what is the uh, spectral measure of Z, right? Because you take the circle of radius 2, um, and this you know, discrete uh, uniform, essentially uniform measure on the circle will converge to the continuous uniform measure on the circle. And the projection, of course, is just projection. So you take the length measure of the circle and project it to the real line. Okay? So that's called the arc sine distribution. Okay, so, so that's the spectral measure of Z. I, did you, I, I made some, so this is just some exercise that I did for you. Okay. So, my next thing is to, um, is to prove you the Wigner semicircle law. There are going to be one or two proofs, depending on how much time I have. Uh, 
try to do a gentle introduction here. Okay, so, um, so let's think of this matrix that I have here as the adjacency matrix of a weighted graph. Okay, so what is the weighted graph? Well, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a path of length n, or length n minus 1, of n vertices. And, and you have weights on the edges, those are the chi's. And you have weights on the, on the vertices, those, you can think of those as loops on the graph. And those are normals. They're independent. So, so, so this, this, random, this random weighted graph is your GOE. Okay. It's another way of thinking of your GOE. It gives you a geometric structure in your GOE. So let's use this geometric structure to get the Wigner semicircle law. So the exercise I need for that is the following. If you look at a, a chi n random variable, uh, it's actually, well, what is it? It's the length of a Gaussian vector of, of, like, of uh, and in n dimensions. So, so, you know, like that's like a Gaussian random walk in n steps. So, uh, uh, under, yeah, so, so the distance of the Gaussian random walk. So, it's going to be roughly square root of n um, that you know. And, and in fact, this converges to a normal in distribution. Um, uh, you can deduce it from the CLT for the square of chi's, which, which is, which has, you know, which is independent, uh, sum of independent random variables. <clears throat> okay, so 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 these chi's, um, for all intents and purposes, they look like square root of n plus the noise, which is of smaller order. And in the off-diagonals, you also have some noise, which is of order 1. So what should you do? You want to take this graph. You divide all the labels by, by, by root n. Okay? And then you take a benjamin ishram limit. Okay. So what does, it, what does benjamin ishram limit see from this graph? Well, let's, let's see. Let's be draw. So this graph. For this benjamin isham convergence, it doesn't really see this small noise, right? Because it's, it's of smaller order. If you divide by root n, it just converges to this square root of n. So it's, it's, it's almost the same as the graph where you put here, you, know, you root, root here as square root of n minus 1 on this, uh, on this edge and divide by n, and you put here as square root of n minus 2 over root n, and so on, right? So you get root 1 over root n. Okay, so, so in terms of benjamin isham convergence, you just see this graph. You don't see the noise. This is uh, all math. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know. Actually, you have local, right? Actually, you have local convergence uh, to the limit of this thing. So what will be the limit of this? Isham limit. So, so, well, the graph structure, you know, the loops have disappeared. And your graph is going to be z. But what are the labels? Well, the labels come from picking your root uniformly at random. Right? So it's, it's, it's a uniform, uh, the position uh, which you have at 0 is a, is a uniform va random variable from 1 to n minus 1, uh, or uh, basically, yes, yeah, yeah, so essentially 1 to n. And and so this label, and also, if you pick your root, then the labels change very little near, near your root. Okay? So if you think about it a little bit, just say, sit back and see what is the, what is the benjamin sham limit of this rooted graph. The answer is simple. You're just going to put a square root of a uniform random variable on every edge of z. And it's the same uniform random variable, not independent. OK? And the only randomness here comes from the choice of root, nothing else. The randomness in this model is basically forgotten. You only see the deterministic picture. 
Okay, so, so that's, that's the Benjamin Isham limit uh, of your of our GOE. Okay, we've taken Benjamin Isham limit of the GOE matrix. This is it. So let's see, what is the spectral measure? Well, it's the expected spectral measure, right? So the eigenvalue distribution, as we discussed, so mu converges to the expected sigma, the expected spectral measure of this random rooted graph. So what is it? Well, the randomness just comes from u. So if we fix u, what's the spectral measure? Well, if you fix u, it's just arc sine, right? And it's scaled by square root of u, width-wise. Okay? So, if, so, so the expected spectral measure is going to be the average of these arc signs according to uh, a square root of a uniform random variable. Okay? So let me tell you this story slightly differently. So what do you do? You pick a circle of radius square root of u, where u is a uniform, uh, pick a random point on the circle and project it down to the real line. Okay? That's, that's, the, that's, that's the answer. So what is it? Well, actually, picking a, a circle <laughs> uniformly uh, according to square root of a uniform and picking a random point in it is just the same as picking a, a random point from the disk. That's, a, that's another exercise, but it's trivial. Okay. So, so we have proved, uh, and uh, it's important that there's without any computation, <laughs> okay, the Wigner semicircle law. Um, Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the end of the first thing. It's <laughs> uh, the end of the proof. And I'm going to give you another proof, which almost, again, also, also almost has no, no computation. Uh, and it's just going to be enough to finish the, the stop. First lecture. So proof two. And it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a proof that is very, in many ways, it's very annoying to me. Uh, but it works. Okay? So, the proof goes by the following. So, I'll take this, I'll take my graph that I have here, 1 over root n with these chi's. And I take now the rooted limit. Okay? So, the rooted limit where root is here. It's not the Benjamin Isham limit. I'm not picking the root at random. But I'm taking the, the rooted limit of this graph. So where does that go to? Well, this chi n over n is going to 1. So, oh my. Yeah, it just goes to z plus. Because this is rooted convergent with this root. OK? So what does this tell me? Well, it tells you that the sigma, which is the spectral measure of the GOE, not the eigenvalue distribution, but the spectral measure, converges to the sigma of this graph, which we already discussed was the Wigner semicircle law. So what is this convergence? This convergence is weak convergence in probability. There are two things, right? Because you have to talk about deterministic convergence, but these are random objects. So, so weak convergence of the deterministic uh, world and, and its convergence in probability to this deterministic limit. These random measures converge to a deterministic limit. So this doesn't quite prove you that the Wigner semicircle law because it's about the spectral measure. Right? The spectral measure is not the eigenvalue distribution. It has weights. But what are the weights? Well, here again, uh, you probably know this, but because you've been here for a while, right? So what are the weights, the spectral weights in the GOE? Well, in fact, in any ensemble which is invariant under orthogonal uh, conjugation, the eigenfunctions are just a random orthonormal frame, right? So their first coordinates are just uh, form a random point on the sphere. 
Okay? So the squares of the first coordinates always form a Dirichlet, Dirichlet one half, one half distribution. Okay? So these are just the same as taking you know, beta one halves and uh, or what is it, gamma one half. So chi, chi squared things. Uh, adding them and then normalizing by their, their sum so that their total mass is, is one, because that's a probability measure, so the weights have to add up to one. And not only is Dirichlet, it's independent of the eigenvalues. Right? Because you, even uh, if you condition on the eigenvalues, you, you conjugate, it doesn't change the eigenvalues, it will change the weight to something. If you conjugate by random, then it changes the way to exactly this Dirichlet thing. So, so the spectral measure here is something very simple. You just have the eigenvalue distribution, and then you put these independent random weights that are Dirichlet on it. So, so what that tells you is if you look at a set, the measure of a set A, and this, the the uh, so this is the eigenvalue uh, mass. Um, let's put an n here. So, the, so let's, and let's call this b because I don't know or a like this. So if you take any any set on the real line and look at what what weight this measure assigns to it, and you can what what weight the the uh, eigenvalue then the spectral measure assigns to it. Okay, then the difference of this by the law of large numbers just converges to zero in probability. Okay. First of all, for this to be non-zero in the limit, you have to have what order n eigenvalues in here, right? And then, and then you're just adding these order, order n independent things from this Dirichlet, or almost independent things from the Dirichlet, so they behave uh, according to law of large numbers things. Okay, so you put together this and this, you get a new proof of the Wigner semicircle law, which tells you that even, even mu n Converges to the Wigner semicircle. Arm. <laughs> and what's really annoying about this to me is that the information of what the spectral measure looks like here and at the random points should have nothing to do with each other. If you take some general graph, there is absolutely no connection. Right? Yet in the in this particular case, uh, in this particular case, it gives you the same answer. So what this tells you is that these Jacobi matrices that correspond to the, to the um, GOE, they're very special. They, they have some sp very special properties that are, that are not typical. Um, and often you can exploit these special properties, as we have done before, to, to prove certain things. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll, do I have any more time? Or? Five minutes, okay. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what I was planning to do uh, next time is to show how a general beta ensemble can also be represented in this, in this way, okay? So, here is how this goes. Um, so if you put a chi of beta over two n minus one, so 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 so, so you take this tridiagonal matrix. And you still put here a normal zero two. and so on. So you do, everything is the same as before, except you put a beta over two in here. Right? So then beta is two is just one. And then you still have a Jacobi matrix. And then you have this beautiful theorem of Dimitri of Edelman. Okay, so. Uh, which, which says that the eigenvalues of this matrix correspond to the beta ensemble 
the Hermit Beta Ensemble. So their joint distribution uh, is, right, has density, uh, the Vandermond Uh, now you raise it to the power of beta with respect to some Gaussian uh, Gaussian uh, I think you have beta over four uh, I'm not sure about this <coughs> sum of lambda i squared so you have some Gaussian background measure which tries to make this kind this guy's Gaussian these uh, these points but then there is some repulsion which makes them spread out <laughs> And, and the joint distribution is, is this. So, so this uh, gives you a very nice tool to analyze these beta ensembles and, and prove various things about it. Um, and so my plan uh, for the rest of the week, or the rest of the three lectures, is, is the following. So, um, so, so, to, so tomorrow, We'll, we'll, we'll tr uh, give you a proof of the of the Drummond-Tree Adonon theorem. Okay, that's that's uh, um, that's um, mostly. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you an almost complete proof of that. So you'll be able to. Actually, it will even give you a complete proof of the eigenvalue distribution for beta equals two. Okay, which if you want to do that precisely, it's not so easy. You can see in, in uh, Ofer's book, uh, Ofer and Anderson <coughs> Zaituni Guionet, Anderson Guionet Zaituni book, that it's actually, if you want to do that precisely, it's fairly, fairly involved. Uh, <coughs> so, 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 but this will give you, uh, you know, a technicality free proof of that. Uh, we're going to do, so this is tomorrow. And I'm going to show you the bike ben arus preche transition. So you may have heard about it. I think this is probably the most famous thing nowadays about random matrix theory, period. This is in engineering textbooks. Uh, and uh, Gerard told me that this is one of his weakest theorems. And I told him, you know, you're, you're still better off than Fatou. Uh, but it's uh, you know it's actually you know the proof there is 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 not that simple. But we will be able to do a very simple proof, which works for general general beta ensembles, mm, using using these uh, using these tridiagonal matrices. Um, so on on the day two and three or day three and four, for now uh, the plan my plan is to think of these. You know, look at this nice geometric structure that we have given the GOE and try to g take a limit of it in various ways. So there are two nice, two simple, actually I've already given you two ways to take a limit, right? The benjamin schramm limit and the rooted limit. Uh, but I want to I take a limit in which this becomes a differential operator, uh, which is called the stochastic area operator. And that will, that will be good to capture the tracy widom distributions for general beta. And I want to talk about also how to use this limit, this representation of the tracy widom distribution to, to deduce various things. And if I have time, I'll tell you how to do the same thing in the bulk. So you can take a third kind of, a fourth kind of limit where you get the bulk, bulk eigenvalue distribution, which is called the sine beta process. Uh, and there is a nice operator there, there called the sine beta operator. So, so that's the plan for the next three days. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? In the case of uh, three shard ensembles, there's also a tri diagonal. What type of graphs is corresponding to? So, so tri diagonal matrix always corresponds to the path, right? Okay, so the, weights the weights are different. So, yeah, I was going to give it as an exercise. So, so the Wishart ensemble, right? Uh, you take some rectangular matrix, you put in IID, IID GOE, uh, IID Gaussians, 
And the Richard ensemble, you look at AA transpose. Um, okay. And here you can already take this original by, by diagonal matrix and, and, and uh, sorry, or original rectangular matrix and bring it into a bi diagonal form uh, without changing the uh, eigenvalues of A in transpose. And then the A transpose will be automatically tri diagonal. Um, so that's uh, very similar to what we did, so it's a good exercise to do. Uh, and that will be actually give you the, the, the Richard case of the bike banner spache transition. Okay. Other questions? Yes? So where can you see the heterozygote polynomials fit into the graph? Um, Yes, so, um, okay, so, so you would like to, so you have this vector E, and uh, let's say that you want to get the vector, this is E1, the first coordinate vector, and let's say that you want to get the vector EK, okay? So you can actually, it's not so hard to check that there exists a unique polynomial, but if you apply this polynomial to A, uh, and you take E1, right? so, so this is some linear combination of powers of A times E, E1, then you get EK. Okay. So that, that's where the orthogonal polynomials come, come in. Um, I'm not completely sure either, but um, there is a, there is, okay, so, so the, let me tell you this way. Uh, there is an L2 isomorphism, okay, as, uh, in general here. Uh, so on the one hand, you have L2 of the matrix, right? so just the, just the ordinary, the, the Euclidean space in which the matrix acts, the Jacobi matrix. Uh, and the, on the other hand, you have uh, the real line with the spectral measure sitting on it. And multiplication by the matrix corresponds to, uh, to multiplication by x in the real line. And then there is a commuting diagram then. Right? So, the, so that's the L2 isomorphism between these two things. Um, and um, so when you construct orthogonal polynomials, uh, that, you know, that has to do with multiplication by x, right? so x and x squared and so on. You, you orthogonalize that. That's the same story on the matrix size of what we did here. I don't know if that helps. Okay. <laughs> Another question? Last question? Okay, so we can thank Berlin again. And looking forward for his lecture tomorrow.